such an honor to be here amongst the giants of and experts in cardiovascular disease in women. I really just stumbled upon this disease, SCAD, 11 years ago, but the past decade has been a wonderful journey in terms of learning this condition with my colleagues from the world. And we learned a lot, um, but there's still a lot of unknowns. Um, so I'll start with a case. So th in fact, you know, we've been told SCAD is rare. It's really not that rare. I saw three cases in the past week. And this is uh, from my weekend on call this past weekend. So a 50-year-old female, G2P2, migraine history, uh, admitted with a non-STEMI, and a troponin of over 20,000 elevation. That was the initial ECG two days prior to me being called. So I was called on Saturday when she then progressed to have some ST elevation in the anterior leads with some T-wave inversion. She actually was chest pain free, but you know, gauging by her age, I said, let's just you know, transfer her over and do her calf today. And this is what we saw. So if you look at her LAD, in the distal LAD, I have a pointer here. Oh, I, I should just point it over yeah. there. So you can see the distal LED is occluded. And, um, and it's, it's somewhat of a TIMI-1 flow to the apical segment of the LED. And the question is, how do we manage that? Well, if you look at the left ventricular angiogram, overall function is normal, but there is apical uh, dyskinesis. And if you look very closely at the renal artery, she actually has FMD of the renal artery. And so this would not have been picked up on the CT angiogram. So in t indeed, routinely, we would do a, um, a DSA or digital subtraction angiography while the patient is in the cath lab to diagnose FMD. So we elected to treat her conservatively, right? Because we, this is the appearance of a type 2B scab. And, uh, and she is chest pain free, even though she has subtle ST elevation, she was chest pain free. So we decided to treat her medically. And why is that? So let's just uh, review some of the, the management um, data we have, which unfortunately is based mostly upon registry data, not on randomized trial data. So SCAT, we know, uh, essentially is a tear of the coronary arterial wall that results in intramural hematoma. Now, in the, in the old days, we were told we should really be looking for intimal disruption, just like here in the distal vessel. And, uh, but unfortunately, this is not the key feature. What we learned over the past decade is that the key pathophysiological mechanism to cause heart attack in SCAD is actually accumulation of intramural hematoma. So the angiographic appearance it can be quite different. So the appearance is actually a narrowing of the coronary artery wall, diffuse narrowing that can be subtle, it can be severe, but it can be cases like this where it's minor narrowing of 30%. And in cases like this, sometimes you need intracoronary imaging to show that this is indeed blood in the arterial wall. Okay? And universally, all the coronary angiogram of SCAD patients typically would have um, features of, of uh, intramural hematoma. So this led to our early days of trying to classify angiographically different what SCAT looks like compared to what we were told in medical school. So type one are those arteries where there's intimal dissection that's clear, and type two is when you have long diffuse narrowing due to compression by the hematoma. Uh, type 2A is when you have normal vessel before and after, and type 2B is when you have long diffuse narrowing that goes to the very apical tip of the vessel, and that can be mistaken as a normal coronary um, a tapering. And type three it mimics atherosclerosis, meaning that it's just intramural hematoma that is somewhat focal and tubular, and typically you would need intracoronary imaging to uh, delineate um, intramural hematoma versus atherosclerosis. Now, some other classification actually utilize a class four. Uh, this is for the European um, uh, ESC guidelines. Uh, so they, they basically classify type four if the vessel is completely occluded. But if you look at very closely for the example that they gave in the document, this is type four, but there's long diffuse narrowing proximal to that. So indeed, this in our core laboratory, we would classify this as type 2B. And in fact, if you uh, would classify all occlusion as type four, uh, in our CANSCAT series of 1,000 dissected artery, 30% would occlude it. So that would be very hard to actually delineate um, um, these features without, uh, so we, what you need to look at is the segment proximal to the occlusion. Now, intracoronary imaging has been very important for us to help diagnose SCAD in the cath lab. Um, but nowadays, we really don't use it unless we're not clear on the angiogram. So when we look at the Canadian SCAD study, um, only 8% of patients actually ended up having intracoronary imaging to diagnose SCAD. 
And when we look at the different categories, type two, the long diffuse narrowing, is the most frequent appearance, 60% of cases. And in about 30% of cases, we would see the type one multiple lumen. And in, the, in about 10% of cases, the type three. So in the old days, when we are not aware of the long diffuse narrowing as the appearance of SCAD, we would have missed over two thirds of SCAD. And that's important to note. And I'm gonna breeze through some of these things. So how do we manage patients with SCAD? Fortunately, um, a lot of patients are like that example I showed, by the time they present to the cath lab, they're chest pain free. So according to the recommendations from the AHA and ESC guidelines, we can treat these patients conservatively, monitor them in hospital for three to five days. But if they present with high risk features like ongoing ischemia or they're hemodynamically unstable, then we should really consider revascularization with either PCI as first line or, or cabbage, uh, especially if they have left main um, disease. So when we manage these patients medically, what are the agents we typically use? Now this, unfortunately, is not based on randomized trial data. Um, typically, we would institute aspirin and beta blocker long term. And this is based on one of our um, post hoc analyses previously, uh, retrospective study that showed that the use of beta blocker was associated with a slightly lower risk of recurrent SCAD by about two thirds. So typically we would initiate beta blockers long term. But the use of other agents like adding P2Y12 inhibitor is really controversial. And you heard about young women having a lot of bleeding issues. So a lot of centers or experts actually don't routinely administer clopidogrel. And um, in terms of management, so when we look at a Canadian SCAD study where we prospectively enrolled 750 patients acutely with SCAD from 2014 to 2018, the vast majority of patients were treated conservatively up front, 86%. And of these cases, only about 2.5% subsequently required revascularization in hospital. So the, the vast majority of patients can be managed conservatively. So in fact, total 84% were managed conservatively. Only 15% underwent revascularization, and that's very important. And what are the outcomes associated with that? And also, why do we do so, right? So we've learned from over the past decade, when we repeat angiogram in patients who were treated conservatively, the vast majority of these arteries would heal. In over 95% of cases, after, if you repeat cath in four to six <coughs> weeks, the arteries heal. And this is um, concordant with other studies as well. This is our study when we repeated cath in about 150 patients. And the other issue about intervention for SCAD is that very often you can have a lot of challenges. You can propagate the dissection. You can propagate the intramural hematoma proximally or distally. And you might even cause um, iatrogenic catheter-induced dissection because the arteries are more frail. So PCI is often fraught with challenges. But we, the pendulum kind of swung the other way completely. And so sometimes patients who are in dire straits and cardiogenic shock were not being treated. So that's not the message that we wanted to send. Because sometimes you do have to intervene. And, and the case scenarios that we need to intervene are when typically when patients have um, this, this hemodynamic instability or they have, they're in shock, they have re recurrent uh, VTVF, they have ongoing ischemia, ongoing chest pain, all right? So when we look at patients who did undergo PCI, now this is in the era where we've already been getting the message out that we shouldn't be intervening routinely. So if you look at revascularization rate, PCI is only 14%. And the rate of success is about two thirds. And if you look at the strategies used, stenting is still the most common strategy. So 65% receive stent for management um, in the cath lab. And this algorithm is just giving you an example of what are the different strategies you can use. You can stent proximal, distal, and then stent the middle, or you can use cutting balloons, or there are different strategies you can utilize. And it's really quite case specific. Um, generally, you know, if you have a dissection and you're using a stent, you want to cover both edges by at least five millimeters. So if there's intramural hematoma, you would limit the extension uh, in both proximal and retrograde dissection. And this is just an example showing that um, we put a long um, 32 millimeter stent in this uh, type one dissection. Here's an example where we stent to distal first and then stent to proximal and then stent to the middle. And uh, the results look good, but uh, I would say that you know, this required three very long stents and it's not the usual mechanism that we would treat nowadays. So in fact, we are using a lot of cutting balloons nowadays. And so this is an example of a patient with a lateral STEMI, ongoing ischemia, with a diagonal artery that's occluded. So we use a cutting balloon, um, make multiple incisions with that, and uh, finish with TIMI-3 flow and a pain resolve. So we didn't have to put any stents in. 
but uh, sometimes you still need to put stents. This is an example uh, of a case two weeks ago. This 54-year-old patient presents a post-arrest, was intubated, ongoing anterior ST elevation, cardiogenic shock. This is my colleague who did this procedure, and I was literally on FaceTime with him <laughs> to help, help him through the procedure. You can see this is a massive occlusion of the LED with a large wall motion abnormality, ejection fraction of less than 20%. You can see that there is dye hang up uh, in the LED territory here, and, um, and it's a big vessel. Uh, we, I suggested using cutting balloon first, but even despite uh, doing cutting balloons in multiple areas, there was still a lot of hematoma and still no flow. So ultimately, we did have to put stent in. And the key was, you know, he wanted to put a stent at the origin of the LED. I said, no, you really have to put a stent extending into the left main to limit the intramural hematoma from being spreading into the left main down the cert. And so that's where we put it. We put it about five millimeters proximal of the, of the intramural hematoma. And, um, and we, we, we had this result. Um, so we cut distal to the stent a um, couple more times, and then we achieve a final result, which is pretty reasonable. There is some residual disease distally, but the key about intervening for SCAT is not to achieve perfection, not like how we do it for atherosclerosis. We really want to just achieve TIMI-3 flow. Even if, if there is some residual dissection, sometimes we might leave that, because the downside about putting more stents in, you're basically doing a full metal jacket. So um, it can be challenging. Now, cabbage is not really done very frequently nowadays. In our series, only 0.7% underwent bypass surgery. And that's typically for patients with left main dissection or very extensive dissection um, in both uh, LED and CERC. So this is new findings that we presented last year at TCT, okay? So can scat long-term follow-up is three years. Um, we published the in-hospital and 30-day results uh, at EHA in 2019. And uh, so at long-term follow-up, what is really remarkable is the low risk of recurrent SCAD. So if you look at a total MACE event rate, 14%, um, of which 10% was due to recurrent MI. And if you look at these risk of recurrent events, 3.5% um, were due to extension of SCAD, which were early on, okay? But true new de novo recurrent SCAT was only 2.4%, which was shocking to me because for years I've been telling our patients, once you have a SCAT event, you're at risk for recurrent SCAT, your risk might be 5% per year. But now, a two-year, three-year follow-up is 2.4%, which is very low. But the question is why? And the other important features here, too, is you look at other um, complication, admission for chest pain or cardiac room, cardiac emergency room visit, was 28%. So a lot of these patients re do represent two ERs or hospital for recurrent pain. And when you look at the, um, the, cap the, the curve, survival curve, most of these events occur very early, within 14 days. Um, so if a SCAT patients survive the initial event, um, their long-term prognosis up to three years is actually remarkably good. So the question is why? So when you look at the medications that we give these patients. At discharge, 94% on aspirin, 85% on beta blocker. And at three-year follow-up, 80% remain on aspirin and 74% remain on beta blocker. This is probably arguably the highest proportional um, cohort of patients with SCAT that has beta blocker long-term. And, um, and also, if you look at the recurrent chest pain, at one month, about 50% of recurrent pain, and at three years, 30% still has some degree of chest pain. So ongoing chest pain is very typical. And when we look at uh, multivariable analyses, uh, we identified three that were independent predictors of three-year maze. So these were genetic disorders, which were typically the inherited connective tissue disorders, postpartum SCAD, and extra coronary FMB. So this is the first um, series have shown that the presence of extra coronary FMD was associated with higher um, MACE at three years, okay? So um, what are the other important management strategies for our patients? I'm gonna wrap up here really quickly, um, and that is screening, okay? So FMD, as I've shown in that particular patient, is very common. Uh, when we routinely do angiography, catheter angiography, to look for FMD in SCAD patients, we see it in 70 to 80%. In this series, um, because not everyone was screened for FMD or had complete screening. For those who had complete screening, 56% uh, have FMD. 
Um, and, um, and, if you, and a lot of these screenings were done by CT, which the sensitivity is, is a lot lower than catheter um, uh, uh, angiography to diagnose FMD. So FMD is a very critical um, risk factor for SCAD. And typically, we would recommend screening um, head and neck, as well as the abdomen and iliacs for all patients presenting with SCAD. And so what, up, what about other strategies to prevent SCAD? So beta blockers I've mentioned, management of the hypertension, minimizing the emotional stress and physical stress. So recommending cardiac rehab is very important for these patients to address some of those emotional, psychosocial issues, and also avoiding hormonal therapies um, and sympathomimetic drugs and even future pregnancies. Obviously, we don't have randomized trial data to support um, a lot of these recommendations, but we find that uh, at least in our long-term follow in, in the prospective study, the event rates were low. So I'll just finish right here. Thank you. Thank you so much.